what is high performance to you? What do you understand by that term? High performance. If you had asked me when I was younger, it'd be a very different conversation. But I think um, for me personally, it's sort of almost dedicating your life to something. Um, and it probably took me a bit of a while to actually see what that was. But that sort of is high performances, doing, um, practicing good habits every day, really, for me. Um, so you said there, that, you said there that you learned you learned that kind of a bit later on. Yeah, yeah. Was there, did you just wake up one day and it just go right? I need to actually dedicate myself to this, or did you learn it from others? Um, or what what happened to make you think like that? I think yeah, a bit of experience obviously is a is a massive thing, um, and um, going through that sort of you know disappointments and um learning as you said from others and um players even around me that I have been playing with for a long time you sort of look, you pick up little bits here and there um and yeah i think it wouldn't it didn't happen overnight um but it definitely i'm still learning as well don't get me wrong but it's um something that i'm really really enjoying um but yeah did you um so when you were younger, and I know you're 27, so you're still young, but when you were younger mm. then, was it more of a case where you knew you wanted to be a professional rugby player, professional athlete? Did you not have the knowledge uh, of what it would take, or did you just, you kind of wanted to do it, but in truth, you also weren't as dedicated? Was it a mindset change? Yeah, I think definitely, like, I definitely always wanted to do it. Um but as you said there, like, I probably didn't have the tools and also have the um, dedication to do it every day. Put it to us in a more practical sense. So let's say okay. a, week, a week of your, your training life now. So yeah. I know you've just played against Harlequins on, the, on yeah. the weekend. But not necessarily what you did on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, but more mm. all the small little things that actually you've learned that mean that on a Saturday your levels of performance are of the kind of the highest level yeah. you, you can get to what, what small little tricks have you learned um i think so for me something definitely that i've always struggled with is like overthinking scenarios in my head so i do like to do like um some meditation and visualization um meditation just to sort of if i'm nervous or anxious calm me down but also visualization to visualize myself performing well on the weekend and it's something that I've only, the visualization side, I've only just starting to get into. Um, but I've used it in training as well and um, definitely seeing some good results around it. Um, are, you seeing yourself, are you seeing yourself in very specific scenarios? So let's, as a I think or you, the scrum, or you, you think yeah, in general? Yeah, I think, um, I think with scrummaging and also my ball carries, because um, I feel like, you can put yourself into when you're in in attack, especially if you're in an attack shape. I feel like you can put yourself in scenarios that you're likely to see quite a lot, um, and I think I, that's definitely helped me in terms of being able to have the confidence when I'm in those positions to be able to make good impacts. Um, so that's something that I've used specifically for that. Um, but yeah, as you said, scrummaging as well it helps with you know just visualizing your process because it's all it's a very process driven um and especially the way we scrum at irish it's very process driven so um yeah it's been, that's probably been the obviously there's quite a few things i do during a week getting prepped for a game but those are the things that i probably have learned over the years and still am learning um I th little small things like that and i think i mean it could be for anything really like even just um, at the start of the week, writing what my intentions and goals are for the week, just just to make sure that I'm, you know, not just cruising into a Monday that I've got a, a clear vision what I want that what I want the week to look like and what I want, want to achieve. Do you know um, what? That's an interesting one because that has yeah. been brought up a few times now with, yeah. with other kind of high performance athletes that they've said whether it's on a day to day basis or the beginning of a week. Yeah. and say what they want to get out of it and not just kind of we i want to win on the weekend but this is what mm -hmm. i need to try and do or these are the training goals i'm hitting or this is what i need to try and 
do to yeah. calm my nerves, but also put myself into the position where I can play at that highest level. Hundred percent, and I think that's. I think, as you said, like I listen to a, a lot of podcasts um, like this, and I listen to the one with Phil. I think it's like every, like most athletes do similar things, like you know, set goals at the start of the week, or I so I, I'll set my goals at the intentions for the start of the week on a Sunday, for example, and then each each evening I'll write down the next day what what I need to get done. Um, and whereas before I thought I thought all about the game. But I also try and um, think about how I can actually just get better rather than focusing purely on the game. Whereas sometimes I think um, I could got, get into the trap where like, I was just purely focused about the game at the end of the week and not really actually getting better each day, yeah. if that makes sense. And are you um, using quite intrinsic feedback with all that? Or are you working alongside a coach or... Do you just kind yeah. of, now you're you're a bit more experienced? Are yeah, you to sink it for yourself, or do you do you kind I think of ask? a combination of both? Yeah, um, I've had pretty close relationships with the um, skills coach Deck Danaher, London Irish. Who that's definitely been a work on for me was be my like catch pass. So over the last six months, we've really like tried to hone in on that because um, I'm I'm pretty like naturally good with ball in hand, so. But I would say that what was letting me down on occasion would be not like catching the ball um, early enough or just not not being able to s sort of put that expression on the ball because I'm just like overrunning my line or whatnot. So um, for, as an example, that's something that I've worked on and had sort of a clear plan with deck for the last couple of months, really. And I felt like, as again, you, you see those when you see those rewards, it's definitely it helps. Yeah. Um, especially in the game. Um, so I think, yeah, that's that's something. But there's something at Irish we have. Uh, so Paddy Jackson and Nick Phipps sort of came up with a skills um, board that we've got in our chain room. Um, and one, so there's two columns and it'll have your name. So it has your name. And then it will have uncomfortable skill. So skills that you find that are hard for you. So. Yeah. For, for me, for example, that would be sort of my yeah my catch pass or um, getting lower in the tackle, uh, and then uh, the other uh, column would be repair skills. So that's stuff that you think that need just need a bit of touching up on. Um, so that can be anything from say you missed a clean on the weekend. You go, oh, I'll, I'll do put clean in there, um, rucking, attack breakdown, whatever. And then you can just sort of, it gives you a guide throughout the week. So, you know, I mentioned earlier about having that guide at the start of the week. That's really good for us as well as at the club because we can also see, our, oh, you need to do cleaning as well. Oh, I can do that with you rather than it being self-driven. You can also pick up people. Oh, you need to do a bit of catch pass. Let's let's do five minutes after training, um, which I think is actually really helpful. It's, it's been a brilliant idea. I guess what's really interesting about that is obviously in a professional mm. environment, it's very competitive. And I know you work yeah. as a big squad and a team, but some athletes find it very hard to kind of say what their weakness is. So yeah. you putting up on the board, this is where I feel uncomfortable. This is a weakness of mine. Yeah. Lots of people actually in sport tend to not want to kind of say it yeah. because they are, whether it's afraid that they might get dropped or the coaches or their, the other players might look at them a bit differently. Is that because Irish have got a very kind of open and honest culture? Is that? Is, mm. is I that think so. Yeah, but yeah, I think it's obviously it is like as you said there. It's like most players won't want to put themselves out there, but I think that's also a really good thing. Like if you're able to have that honesty, um, and you know, I think I I've definitely been guilty of of the in the past is that. Um, thinking so much about your individual performance rather than what's best for the team um, and focusing. And I think if you're willing to drop your sort of drop your ego and put up there what you actually think rather than just trying to do a tick box onto the board, then I think the team's going to benefit, not just you as well. Um, so I think that's the way we're trying to look at it there. And I mean, Paddy and Nick are really good at driving that. Um, 
and they're on our case if we're not if we haven't put it up at the start of the week. Um, but I think yeah, as you said, it's like is definitely this season. It's been a real shift in performance for us. So think little things like that are definitely helping, um, and just gives a bit of accountability as well. So I wanted, to, I wanted yeah, good man. I want to take you back. Um, was it eleven years now? It seems a very long time ago. Wow. But uh, when you're at Cranley, um, yeah, and obviously. It, we're not kind of doing a story of your life, but where I think your journey into being now 27 full-time professional rugby player, RPA, and all of the all the stuff you've mm. achieved, your your pathway was is I think still quite unique in terms of access into it. So for those who who are listening to this, um, and I'll kind of just talk about you for probably like 30 seconds. What was it? At 16, you got dropped by Quinns. From the academy um throughout your time you never actually did any youth representation in terms of england or anything mm. like that was it there was no england 16s 18s no england students nothing like that no. so you went from school to university um you then took a trial with london irish being probably one of the older players in that academy you're taking a trial there over a, basically mm. a summer to then go from being in the academy at a slightly older age than the normal 18, 19 year old. So now being 27 and a number of caps for London Irish in a mm. premiership. The, the interesting bit, I think, for a lot of the parents and the kids to, to hear is actually sometimes the, the down moments. So obviously you're now sitting there probably mm. in a good position in terms of look at all I've achieved, look what I've done, and you should feel very proud of it. But when you were mm. younger, so let's with Quinns, for example, being released by them. And and we naturally, they'll have to make choices and lots of kids will find this, whether it's with age group representation or academy. How did you find that getting released? And, and looking back, what advice would you be giving to parents and the kids of who, who do get released? Because it, it, it obviously does happen because it's so mm. subjective. I think, yeah, I think obviously I found it really difficult um at the start um i think being at cranley and around you guys and the rest of the lads there um definitely helped in terms of put, taking my mind off it um purely because i know that we had such good group group there that um it was definitely with the group we had it was we had so much promise as well so i was like really excited to just keep um playing at Cranley and just see what sort of happened. Um, and then I know uh, yourself and Witters was, spoke to me about um, about Loughborough as being an opportunity for me. And that was definitely something that I was um, excited for. So I didn't, even though I was very disappointed about um, being at, uh, losing out at Quinns, that I was definitely excited to go to Loughborough. And give it a real go there. Um, do you think? Do you think, looking back, Quinns were right to release you? Definitely. You, and why is that? I don't think I was ready to be in that environment. Um, and I think looking back on it, I've definitely always said this: that um, you yourself, in particular, instilled work ethic into me, which I don't think I had when I was at Quinns, um, and that hasn't really ever left me. My, I, I definitely, I do definitely think coming and training with you guys, uh, Lamont and JT, that I definitely it instilled a work ethic in me, and it was the start of me being able to um, actually shine. And I felt like when I got to Loughborough, then that's when I I started to actually play, um, like almost fulfil my potential in a way because. Um, I already had that work ethic built into me. Um, it's interesting. From being yeah. at it's really interesting because mm. every year people get released, and you know how hard yeah. professional rugby rugby is. And at the age of 16, 17, 18, and across all sports, some make it, some don't, and the majority don't. It, it's mm. kind of sadly the fact of professional or elite sport. Um, but often, often it's quite interesting the honesty that you've obviously got looking back going. Well, actually, did I deserve to stay into it? Mm. And like you said, probably not. 
And I think it's sometimes really hard, isn't it, to at the time mm. to put up your hand and say, yeah, actually, I haven't probably trained hard enough. I probably haven't dedicated myself quite enough. So definitely, you know, as much as I'll blame the coaches at the time or I'll blame, you know, someone else as a favourite, actually, in a cold light today, you probably weren't ready. Yeah, definitely. And then, and then the university route. Mm. Obviously, I, I, we, we stayed in touch, so I know that you enjoyed Loughborough in terms of mm. how did you find balancing a university experience, uh, the academic side, as well as yeah. kind of trying to become a professional athlete? Was it hard? Oh, yeah, I definitely found it tough, especially um, in my first year in terms of it was just so, so new. Um, I'd obviously been at Cranny and bored. I uh, was used to being away from home, but um, I found it really difficult to handle all the different things. Um, as you said, we were playing. We when you're at Loughborough, you're and you're in the elite sort of pathway. There, you're pretty much training every single day, and coupling that up with learn, um, trying to learn um, and be in, be a student. Um, with the nightlife as well it's just it's really it's really hard balance and I definitely struggled for the first sort of six months to get that balance right um, but I think because of because some of the lads were going through the same thing I think we we all pretty much um, pretty much got through it together kind of thing and just sort of strapped in late nights and I remember being doing all nighters in my first year I don't know how I did them just to get the work done, just because I hadn't, um, hadn't got it done. So it was it was interesting, but definitely worthwhile um, and an interesting experience. Um, but I wouldn't have, wouldn't have changed it for the world, really. It was one, one of my favourite times of my life being there. So, And do um, you, you're now kind of uh, an RPA representative at London yeah. Irish. So for those who don't know what that means, you're basically the London Irish's player's voice um, to the clubs to try and kind mm. of uh, it, what would you call it? I, I'm trying to think of a like the uh, like kind of like yeah, a union, yeah, yeah. Like players union. So players union to to have that is huge responsibility. Would you be saying to people to the kids who are 16, 17, 18 that, that actually that route towards university is something that you kind of would say to the 18, 19 year old who's joining the clubs, go and get the, the education as well, or definitely, you, yeah, I think, yeah. I think if if you go through a similar thing to what I did, um, and regards getting released, it's definitely worthwhile. Um, and it's um, something that I think you originally it's not always what you want, but it's something that is definitely going to help you in the future. I mean. Even just having my degree um, and learning actually how to study was really important um, because it sounds stupid, but I didn't really know how to study like to that level of uh, the university level. Like I was obviously worked really hard at A levels with some of the lads around me, but actually being able to write papers and uh, be able to use Excel, etc., you, you don't really get that um, until you do a uh, do a degree which was pretty interesting for me yeah. um and i didn't really know about it and you learn a lot of practical skills as as well as that so i think i think that's pretty something that i didn't realize was going to be so useful now looking back on my now moving into different things like the rpa role um and some of the nutrition stuff has definitely helped me to bridge that gap between um which i didn't think was actually going to be useful but it it really has been is it yeah and i think yeah. you touched upon it is that you, you learn how to learn don't you so whether yeah. it's it, it's kind of in a classroom or in a lecture theater mm. learning how to learn has obviously had a, an impact on your performance as a as an athlete yeah. because you start taking responsibilities you you understand deadlines you understand turning up definitely yeah when you don't want to do something you still do it and understanding that commitment to something in over a three-year period i do think you know, you, you often start and you think, well, this is uni. And by the end of it, you've actually learned how to learn to take responsibility for Definitely. yourself. Because whereas at school, you'll have T 
teachers or your tutor or your house parent telling you what to do mm. suddenly you've got to go out there and make your own choices and you know as you get older you hope with a really good education you make the right choices but it's yeah it's too easy 100 percent. and how did you Such find point. how did you deal with the the kind of the nerves of going to london irish so i know nick kennedy mm. kind of yeah took you in you were probably what 21 22 which is yeah, i think yeah yeah, which, it, which compared to most, so most academies, you're looking at 18 up to around 21. Mm. And then normally by 21, 22, you're into the first team. Coming from university and then into the academy, how did you deal with the nerves of it? Did you find yourself nervous being on trial? I think, yeah, so I think, um, I luckily you set it up. <laughs> so I think my first, I think I, think I was... It was the end of my second year, so I would have been twenty. Yeah. But when I got signed, I would have been twenty-one, I think. So the original was the first summer was the pre-season, and I think Kendo had just gone into his role there with uh, Decky and Paul Hodgson. And I think um, I was obviously really nervous. Like, yeah. don't get me wrong, I was really nervous because I'd never been in an environment like that. Um, and, but I think. Like the first thing I had was a fitness test and I did really well in it for, for a prop. So I think that set a really good standard for me to, um, like that settled my nerves a bit. I was like, all right, I've actually done really well here. Like, and, um, yeah, and that, that sort of came back to like that whole, um, thing about, you know, working hard. I think that's definitely, that helped me because I was like, oh God, if I, if I can do well here, then this, hopefully I'll be, be all right for the rest of it and then yeah i just didn't after that i just really got stuck in really i just um i mean it was a really hard pre-season i was only there for a month because i was going back to loughborough um but i th i know kendo was pretty like impressed with i think my attitude and my um just going going after everything um mm -hmm. so yeah, it was really like, it was a massive learning experience for me because sort of around international rugby players, which I'd never been around before, and uh, Premiership rugby players. So that was it's a really cool experience for me. And I went back to Luff Loughborough the following month. So I think I did like the whole of July, and then went back to Loughborough pre the pre-season. And I just like was just different. Like even just that month, I was just like blowing the fitness test out of the water. I was just I just a lot more confident about myself and. Then went on to play sort of like nearly thirty games that year for Loughborough. Yeah. In that one, it was like I think I missed one game um, out the whole season, which um, and I was playing tight head as well, so I was pretty I was pretty happy with that to be fair because um, as you know, that one's a very tough league. Um, so yeah, but I think yeah, it was just an amazing experience for me, and it was just sort of eye opening. And then I think when I started to actually do well there, I was like, right. I can actually, I could actually do this. Yeah. Um, what, what, what did you learn? As in, obviously, your confidence yeah. came and physically, you you're in good condition um, mm. through training all the time. So, professional environment, there is no excuse not really to be fit. But yes, what did you find about the environment that was so eye opening? Was it was it the how I loud think... people trained, how fast yeah. it was? Was there anything that really stood out to you? How different it was training and um, international players. I think it was just like everyone was like it sounds stupid, but everyone was big, strong, fit, and like like they could play. Everyone could like really play and had real good skill set on on the whole. So I think that was just like when we were doing the conditioning games and for the preseason, it was, that was just like the biggest. Just seeing like the how people can just go back to back to back um, in terms of their effort like day in, day out, they can just keep going, keep going. Um, I think just, yeah, their mentality as well, just like, it was very full on as well, which was, which I really enjoyed, um, how like professional, like professional it was, um, which was, yeah, that was, that was eye opening for me, just the professional, how professional the team was. Um, and just like the small things, like having like um, protein, protein on the wall that you can go and fill your shaker up with like i just that I, that just sort of amazed me really <laughs> stuff like that just like real small little things i was just like this is this is really cool i want to be a part of this so 
uh, yeah. And then just, um, I think yeah. And then you got to you kind of went back to Loughborough and then you kind of signed with London Irish and what was it six years mm. later you, you're still yeah. there. Um, I guess what's quite or I'm quite interested in one we'll talk about your nutrition in a sec. I know you, mm. you trained yourself up in that area, but one kind of area that people used to always kind of question was always scrum. So mm -hmm. for those who've seen you play or those who saw you play when you were at Cranley all those years ago, yeah, where you were suited or are suited to professional sports is you're someone who likes to be involved in games. And what I mean by that is you sometimes get people who will drift in a match. You mm. sometimes get people who train very well. But when it comes to the game, they kind of are bystanders. They let other people really go for it. Whereas yeah. you've always been someone who wants the ball in hand. You want to make mm. tackles. You want to make impacts in a game. And that psyche, that mentality is something that the top end players all have. They they don't want to just be bystanders. They want to they want the game to they want to be part of it. They want to really make an impact. Mm -hmm. But the scrum was always something that anyone who coached you would always say, listen, this guy born in hand, athletically, his physicality superb, but the scrum's his area of weakness. Mm. How did you find how did you block out that noise? Did you block out that noise? Did you find it kind of impacted your confidence? Um, because uh, often we all we all have a weakness, um, particularly mm. in sports. Um, but obviously, in your position, the scrum work is such a huge part to it. Mm. Did you did you manage to block the noise out in the end, or was it just hard work mm. that got you now to the position where coaches now trust your scrum your scrum work? Yeah, I think yeah, it's definitely something I've struggled with and. It's like, I don't think you'll ever be satisfied with um, a skill like that. I think it's like very, you always want to have improvements. And like the day that you don't have any improvements is probably the day you need to retire because it's like a constant work on, I think, even the best in the world. Um, one of the boys at the club says like scrums have no history. So like every scrum's a new scrum. Like it doesn't matter if you've dominated before, it's always coming back to the... Um, it's always like a new, a new scrum sort of thing. So it's always, so I think it's an area that you have to be like, as I spoke about earlier, like you have to be like working on it all the time. And that's something I still do now, like all the time working on it. Um, and it's really good at that Irish as well. I think it was, it obviously was tough at the start, but got a really good scrum coach called Ross McMillan, who's used to play. Um, and he's like so enthused by it, so uh, about scrummaging, which is great because we all love it as well. So we get we have some really good conversations there, um, and yeah, but it was obviously like it has has been hard. Like when it doesn't go your way, you obviously always want to always want it to go your way, don't you? But that's kind of the nature of it. Um, but, and, you, um, and during your time with like, Irish, have you mm. actually across? No, I, I take that. But not just Irish, but obviously playing against all these internationals and professional mm. um, uh, rugby players. Have there been times, or has there been an individual in particular that you've looked at and played against and just thought that is that's where I want to get to? And mm. if so, what was it about them that you really looked at and thought that is something that I can really learn from? Is that in terms of scrum or their whole game? Maybe. Well. Uh, Let's go for two. Let's go someone you've, yeah. you've scrummed against and then um, someone the whole game. Or it may not even be the game. It might be just the way mm. they prepared or the way they trained or just the attitude. Yeah. I think I think so. With the scrummaging, there was a guy called Petrus de Plessis who is, was at Saracens for a long time, is now the Wallaby scrum coach who came to Irish for a couple of years. Um, I think he was at Irish for two years about uh like two years ago um last summer in the premiership and his he was like he's the hardest scrummager i've ever gone against he's just like so strong and like uniquely like powerful um and yeah he was like pretty cool to learn off like and he was he's a really nice guy as well so that made it even easier um yeah so he he's probably like in terms of like being in like you're 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 the best that I've been against really. Yeah. 
Um, and then I'd probably say around the park. Um, there's a, there's a couple I think. Um, with with the likes of like, I remember playing Sam Simmons when he was at Cornish Pirates, and just being a bit blown away by his ability, like the way that he can his acceleration and um, his like speed off the mark is just like until you're actually facing him, you don't realise like. Um, and he was, this is going back sort of four years now, like when he was just playing, when he was up and coming, he was just, he was, he was pretty, pretty incredible. Um, so I was definitely always, always like thought, oh, he's something that I want to emulate, try and get that sort of uh, ability to beat players in small areas. And then I think another person that sticks out, comes out straight ahead. Like as soon as I think of like, when you say that, I probably think, um, of Jack Willis as well. Just his ability to poach over the ball was pretty incredible. Like, um, I mean, we'd done a lot of work on him the whole week and he still managed to get two or three turnovers against us. And even though we were sending like two, three men into the breakdown, he's just so quick over them, so strong over the ball. And I think that was, those two players kind of stick out in my mind who I've played against. I'm like, they're, 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 they're the best, I think. Yeah. Um, Interesting, isn't it? Both of them have yeah. that power kind of concept, yeah. isn't it? That the game now isn't just about how big you are. It's actually that's no. the, the game. Yeah. I remember talking to one of the girls who's kind of going up the ho hockey ladder. She was saying every time you go up a ladder, it just gets quicker and quicker. And that's, I guess, the same with rugby. It's just yeah. the speed of things that happen. So your skill set's got to get better. You're... you're tackling technique everything's got to get better because everything's happening faster mm -hmm. 100 percent. um that's definitely it like hopefully one day i get to play international and i get to see that but yeah the premiership is obviously very quick yeah um and physical um but as you said it's so true like those two lads are probably not two of the biggest lads but they are probably two of the most powerful guys in the premiership and and their speed all around the park and fitness like they're just i think that's as well like emulating them being able to do action after action they're just like relentless which is like even if it's the first or the 80th minute they're still going to be running the same as they had done at the start of the game so i think that was definitely something that i was like wow these these guys are real good yeah and mm. and if you were talking to yourself when you were kind of 18 so your final year at school mm. knowing what you know now back then what would you be saying to yourself is there anything in particular that you'd be saying listen um had an interesting journey and it's been nice to think oh, i'd have changed this or that but is there any advice you'd have given yourself i think yeah i think like um that i am a good rugby player yeah. and not and not just then not thinking that i'm sort of that i have got the ability to do it um but I think also just, yeah, like everyone always says it, but like enjoy the journey as well. Like um, that's the funnest part. It's not where sort of like it's very cliche, but that genuinely do resonate with that a lot. Like really enjoy what you're doing day to day because you don't know how long you've got with it. Um, have you, have you, lost, so, did you lose your confidence then? Because you brought it up uh, a few times here about kind of um, saying to yourself that you are actually a good player. Mm -hmm. Did I don't, you, yeah. Yeah. Do you lose your confidence or have you lost your confidence? I don't think I lost my confidence. I just don't, I didn't think, like, I would, like, I always had that sort of imposter syndrome, I think, like, well, I was like, oh, I shouldn't be here, sort of thing. Um, and which it took me a while to get you, like, get over because I, I, don't, I don't know why. Um, it was just one of those things I like, just, oh, you're not, you're not good enough to be here. But then, as soon as I get onto the pitch, like it's like over, like it's over, like my head, I have nothing like that. So it was, yeah. it was working with uh, Mike, who's a psychologist who's been there for a very long time now, Irish, sort of being able to change my mentality on that is, was um, something that I still do obviously struggle with, not massively, but it sometimes will creep in now and again. Yeah. Um, and it never, it never affects me on the pitch. It's always, like leading up to a game or 
when I know I've got a tough session, <laughs> it, it might just creep in, but it's just finding ways to be able to deal with that. Um, you, what, what ways have you found to deal with it? I think, like, as I said earlier, that meditation and being able to know that I've done everything that I can do. Yeah. I, I definitely try and pride myself on leaving no stone unturned, whether that's to do with recovery or uh, training, just to make, just to sort of, not not like a tick box exercise. I, don't, I, I never want to just do stuff for the sake of it. But just to give myself peace of mind when I get to that game day that I've done everything I can do and now I've just got to go out and enjoy it. Yeah. And that's yeah, definitely that's something. The way that, I do. I think, yeah. I think that confidence for you is it generally would come from the fact that, like I said, at 16, you got released. Yeah. Through your whole pathway, mm. people didn't really know you. And, it, and I think that's the interesting bit is that if you actually compare yourself with, your peers from um i don't know I, I can't recall who probably played england 18 was in your final year at school but it'd be interesting to look back how many of them actually made it mm. in the career that you're having um but it, it probably did leave some scars the fact that yeah you never you never kind of got up that ladder mm. at a young age and you had to do it a very different route and you suddenly come into it and you've built your reputation and name by actually playing in the premiership. Whereas mm. a lot of people sometimes are very talented when they're 15, 16, 17, build up a bit of a, a name for themselves and they probably hold on to that for a little bit. Whereas actually Definitely. you've had to kind of do it and probably still do it every day is you haven't got in the program, Harry Aaron's mm. in the 16s, England 18s, England 20s, in, you know, yeah, yeah. You haven't got that. You're Harry Ellington, love for students, mm. and uh, and London Irish, and maybe that's the part to it that actually is a bit of a superpower for you because you're always having to prove yourself. But it might be mm. sometimes a weakness because you think, ah, do I do do I deserve this or do I kind of should I be here when I'm looking around looking at all these internationals? But you know, mm. when you run on a pitch, everyone's the same, isn't it? You, you're all exactly, the same. Yeah. It's, it's kind of it's individual battles. It's can you yourself kind of push you, push your talent? Hundred percent, completely and, agree with that. And a really interesting part. And I know you mm. came to Cranley, was it two years ago, to talk to the to mm. the pupils about nutrition? And you mm. were saying earlier that you've got qualified in it. Um, you've got the um, rugby grub, um, yeah. which is kind of getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I could talk to you for hours about nutrition and in particular mm. for the 16, 17, 18 year olds who generally their diets aren't great. Um, yeah. But if you can, and I know this is quite tricky, if you could think mm. of some golden rules that you'd be saying to a young athlete across all sports, um, yeah. probably two or three kind of golden nuggets, you'd say, listen, above everything, this is what you should be doing. Do you have something yeah. like that that, that you could share? Yeah, I think like a few things come straight to mind i think separate to nutrition um would be definitely sleep don't underestimate how important sleep is um because not getting enough sleep will affect what you're eating as well um so i say definitely for energy levels and you know concentration levels make sure Oh, and also recovery is like the most, this is the key thing for recovery is making sure that you've got enough sleep. And when coming on to nutrition, I think um, for performance, it's really important that you're eating enough, um, not just around sort of um, your games, but around uh, your training as well. It's really important to make sure that you're fueled up for training. When I'm talking about fueling, I'm talking about getting adequate carbohydrates in, um, making sure that you're um, also hydrated going into training, just so that you can have the best session you possibly can. You want to put yourself into a um, when you're at the training session that you've you know you've ticked those boxes and you can perform to the best of your ability. Um, and that goes for recovery as well. After training, you want to be having a decent amount of protein as well as um, some carbohydrates to refuel your muscles. Um, I think those making fueling and refueling around training is, are probably the two things that I didn't know about as well as I did when I was younger and moving up 
um, at into Loughborough. Um, but I think it's really important to make sure that you're fueling up properly. Um, I think that's I said, also, been, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you, where you are probably in a great position to talk about it is the fact that mm. in the professional or high performers, training isn't a t like you mentioned it isn't a tick box exercise you don't train no. for the sake of training if you train you're training to get better and i speak to the people here a lot so that when you go to training for me there's three areas that you can improve either, either it's your physical condition it's your yeah. skill sets or it's your knowledge of the game and ideally a great training session all three of those are kind of improving but let's say only yeah. one does then that's fine but you don't just turn mm. up to train for the sake of training and go through the motions. That's no. that's worthless. You might as well just not train whatsoever. Um, and it's interesting that your nutrition links into that. The fact that mm. get yourself prepared, hydrate yourself, fuel yourself so that you can train and really train to the highest level you possibly can, because that's how your body's going to make the adaptation. Mm. That's how you're going to get the confidence on a Saturday to perform because you've actually trained at match tempo or, you push yourself so you 100%. know you can handle it 100 percent. yeah i couldn't agree more that that's a really good point like it's um it's about yeah you want to make sure that you've put yourself in the best position possible really um especially if you have you know aspirations and i'm not saying you know it's really important that you enjoy your training as well but this will allow you to enjoy your training even more yeah. because i think like you know everyone always knows when you when you train well there's a direct correlation over to you playing well, whatever sport that is. Yeah. Um, so I think it is really important to make sure that if you can instill these small habits of fueling up for training and being hydrated, it's going to have a direct correlation to you getting better as a player, um, whatever that is, um, which I think is definitely something that's speaking to coaches, SNC coaches, um doing a few few of these talks that is definitely underestimated um how important it is um and something that i think um small changes can make a massive difference for you like so like go and eat x like x amount of whatever it's just about instilling some you know sustainable habits that are gonna benefit you going forward like that's the way i look at it yeah no um, I, I don't disagree i i think generally yeah. uh, uh, most schools kids under eat mm. uh, particularly yes, the fact that they it. are kind of they're growing they're training they're trying to get better they play a lot they mm. yeah their calorie intake is probably less than it's probably around 1500 calories per day but yeah in truth they need to be kind of doubling that if they want to yeah. kind of get that high level performance in, in terms of that, like what kind of calories are you taking in per day i th i'll probably it will change day to day um depending on the intensity of my training but tend to be on like a monday and tuesday which i mean our tuesdays are our big days as they have normally have, everyone has big tuesdays um but what i'll do now is i'll probably load up a bit more carbohydrate on the monday evening so i know i've got a big day tuesday where i'm gonna have two or three sessions so i'm probably on a tuesday probably four thousand i reckon yeah. um and then that was obviously dropped down a bit naturally anyway, because I won't be as hungry on a Wednesday when I have a day off. Um, but I probably would say between, you know, three, three and a half to 4,000 a day, I would think. Yeah, because I think that's, um, again, something that a lot mm. of people, a lot of kids in particular wouldn't understand is the fact that, yeah. that their calorie intake or their nutritional intake does have yeah. to change with the day. So if you're, if you're suddenly got a, you know, you're doing a double session on a Monday, well, yeah. obviously on the Sunday and Monday, your calorie intake is probably higher. If you've got a kind of a lower intensity day or a rest day, mm. then actually you can slightly, well, you should be lowering it down. Yes. It kind of does that. Whereas I think a lot of people think whether it's the, you know, government advice, 2,500 for a male. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. For female, think, well, that's just what I should take per day. But it has to link in, particularly with sport, with what sport they're doing, the intensity of their training. If actually mm. the, the training session is not very high intensity, then obviously you haven't burnt as much, so you don't really yeah. in as much. And... Definitely, yeah, that's it's something that um, you definitely need to practice as well. It's not just it won't just happen overnight. Like, um, I mean, it's I, I'm qualified in nutrition. It's obviously still taken me a long time to 
understand so it's about you know understanding your body but what as well as you just said there having a plan in place if um to be able to you know oh i've got yeah i've got a double session tomorrow i'm gonna have a bit more carbohydrate tonight like i need to be fueled up tomorrow i'm not gonna have the opportunity to eat as much because i'll be training so how can i get the calories in around my training like just little things like that and just having like um just a conscious effort to have a a sort of not a, a strict plan in place because a strict plan rigid plans like they won't they're not going to help out as long as you're flexible in it um because you especially when you're at school it's really really hard to get um because you have like regimented um like meals throughout the day and mixed in with your training and lessons um it's really hard and I it's something that we obviously we try to when we were at Cranny we try to sort of bring in some meats around training and had protein shakes and stuff like that little things like that it's just about understanding where you're going to get your feedings from and how much you need to eat per day which as I said will take time to understand but if you instill a few good habits each day they'll compound and um hopefully you'll um yeah, make make improvements in that area. Yeah, I agree. Like it's mm. you're never gonna have at any school the perfect diet for a high performing athlete. It it just will never happen. Just through the timings, let's say you're training at three o'clock and you've had your lunch at one thirty, that hour and a half is probably a bit too soon and stuff like that. But mm. doing things like eat more veg, drink more water, mm. try to make sure you have some form of protein, whether it's a chicken sandwich or something after training, making 100%. sure that you're not turning up to training kind of under fueled, making sure that you wake up in the morning, you, you have your protein, you, you have your carbohydrates that change mm. from white bread to brown, you know, just small little habits. Yeah. They all do kind of add up, don't they? It's hundred percent. It, it's not kind of trying to say to yourself, I'm never going to drink a can of Coke or have a pizza ever again, but no. if you make little steps in the right direction. It can become habit. And then suddenly, having a bowl of veg and salad every meal or every lunch and every dinner and actually mm. that those vitamins and minerals are helping and it's just it's just kind of it, yeah it's just they look yeah. i hate the word one percenters but it, it kind of yeah is. just those one percenters do make a big difference to it yeah definitely definitely and yeah it, as you said it doesn't need to be drastic like just just having an understanding of you know as you mentioned there like having a chicken sandwich or having a feeding after um a protein feeding after you've uh, trained that's just a, a small habit that's gonna you know compound and make you better which is normally what we're trying to do is just get better um yeah and, and the fight yeah the final area i want to talk to you about and you know, mm. a few of the kids asked me to kind of talk to you about it in terms of being professional um athletes um and selection how do you handle it when selection doesn't go your way so on a weekly basis, you're you're either in the match day squad, you're either starting or you're not involved. How do you how do you take the the kind of timings when you're not involved in the squad? So let's say you're dropped. Mm. Uh, how do you deal with that? Um, I'd say I definitely say like accept that you're going to be angry. And accept that you're going to be emotional about it because if you're not, then you're probably like you probably shouldn't be playing. Yeah. Um, so as soon as you can accept that that's the case, then I think it allows you to um, just crack on, and and it's obviously very easy to say, but you know, having that ability to just park it and then think, I definitely try and. If I'm not playing, I try and just, as I said, right at the start is, you know, I, I've got a really good opportunity here in this week where I'm not playing and I'm not going to be doing as much. Um, normally, you don't do as much as the boys that are playing. You'll do more conditioning work, but you've got a really good opportunity to do, like, improve your skills. You know, if you've got uncomfortable skills you need to do, you can do that. You've got a really good opportunity to get some extra weight sessions in. Um, and you've got, like, it's... It's really, it's really easy to get trapped in a, or like, 
I've definitely experienced it in the cycle where you're just like really angry because you're not playing. But it's, it's, as I said, if you can accept that, it can also have some really good possibilities to like uh, grow your game or grow also outside of rugby as well, not just or not just sport. Sorry, outside of sport where you know you, you've got a bit more time to socialise or you can go and um, you can go and do a bit more work on something that you're like you're you know with me my nutrition I can do a bit more nutrition work because I'm not playing it gives you a bit of uh, opportunity elsewhere as well so um I think it's do you normally let's say you do kind of your aunt involved yeah do you do you go and seek um the coach out to find reasons or do you actually look at yourself yeah. and go look bit of self-reflection here have mm. I trained well this week what areas do I know last time I played, I didn't play that well. So therefore, fair enough, I just got to work on those. Mm. Or do you go, is it a mixture of both? I think, yeah, a mixture of both. I think, um, yeah, like I definitely want to have uh, get clarity on why I'm not playing. But then also, um, it's really important to be self-aware of. On, and I think, well, I keep coming back to it, but having those intentions and goals and, skill work on throughout the week definitely helps to shape um that self-awareness like if you're self-aware um about what you need to work on then um it's definitely it'll definitely help get over the fact that you're not playing because you've got a bit more clarity on the areas that do need some work um so i think yeah that's it's, it's definitely a mixture of both i'd say um, you want to have clarity from the boss, but also you want to be able to um, be self-aware enough to um, know what you need to improve on and what's going to make you a better player for the team. I think that's really important. And, it, and um, here, here's my final one, and it's probably a bit of yeah. a selfish one from me. As a player, do you want the honest truth from a coach or do yeah. you kind of want part truths because sometimes as a as a coach and i've experienced mm. this it's maybe a gut feeling you're going with someone else because you just think they are maybe that little yeah. bit better or, or you know there's something about the way that you've trained or played or something that you just thought oh, i don't fancy them this weekend if you heard that though would you would that be better or actually do you prefer the kind of like well harry we need you to work on your scrum technique again or we need mm. You know, I definitely, yeah, I think it's, I think you've got to trust the, the coach, like whatever they say, like I, I definitely would like, like it to be as honest as possible. Um, just so I have, as I said, clarity on, you know, what I need to do to get into the team and what I need to do to help the team out. But also, you know, it gives you that. I just, I, I like to be upfront as, as possible and. Um, I think that's definitely something that's underrated. Um, and I think it does build that trust between you and the coach. Um, and you feel like if they are honest with you, then you can, you, you'll trust them and you trust their word and you, you, you're more likely to go and play harder for them in reality. That's, you, you know, if you have that subconscious where you think, oh, he's not being massively honest with me then maybe you do have a bit where you're like oh i don't want to play like i, I might not want to play for him but like, i've never experienced that but that's definitely that i've some things that i've heard in the past and um other other sports that can can cut, come up so i think it is really important honesty is really important for me personally um and i think it does build that trust between you and also your teammates as well just if everyone knows the the crack then um it's a lot easier i think yeah. Um, but that's just, it's obviously different for everyone. Not everyone's going to have that opinion, but that's just the way I think, think about it. Yeah, no, I, I, it's always a, it's always, mm. I find like, particularly in the professional kind of setting, probably the hardest yeah. one for coaches is how they actually talk to the players about who's playing, who's not, um, yeah. to try and get the best out of them. And at times it's, well, majority of sports is so subjective, isn't it? It's, it's just an 100%. opinion. And one person might think you're the world's greatest. Another person might think actually you're not very good and you can't control that, but you can probably control the way that you think about your own levels of performance, your own training habits, your own nutrition. And that's definitely you can put your energy into. 
yeah, you can as you know, as cliche as it comes, like control the controllables, like yeah. it is very cliche and everyone says it a lot, but um I think it is really, really true. Like you can't oh, control yeah. whether you... Yeah, it is, isn't it? Like I, yeah. of all yeah. of all the peoples or all the kind of really high performing athletes that I've ever been associated with, generally speaking, the ones who really go and make it they do control what they can control and they're out there mm. and they're practicing and practicing and practicing and they're not just saying they want to do it they actually go and do it you don't mm. get fitter without working on your fitness you don't get stronger without kind of going to the gym you don't improve your skills without going out there and practicing those skills but properly practicing, mm. not just standing there chucking a ball around or hitting a, a ball into a got an empty goal you've actually got to practice and practice and practice it to yeah. get it better and those and you must have experienced this with London Irish. Those who really are at the highest level are probably the ones who train at that level and practice yeah. those skills. Paddy Jackson doesn't just kick mm. on a Saturday; he's probably out there for hours during the week, yeah, yeah, yeah. working on his yeah. skills. You, you talked about your scrummaging that it's a process; mm. it's hours upon hours of work. It mm. doesn't. You don't just wake up magically; it's suddenly better. It's it's hard to work, isn't it? And I think sometimes. 100%. We, we as kind of, I'd well, say we, I don't play, but athletes, sometimes they're looking externally for an excuse rather than actually, am I mm -hmm. good enough or, and have I worked hard enough at this skill to give myself confidence in a match to go and do it? Definitely, 100%, yeah, such a good point. <laughs> and it's like the comes back to that, like when you mentioned earlier about the, what high performance is for me, and I think it just comes back to that, like dedication, doesn't it? Like, yeah dedicating your life to something wherever that is like it's not just sport it's work as well whatever it is is you're going to get the best out if you you know dedicate your life to it and and that's what you have to do in in high performance environments yeah. so like because if you're not doing it someone else is and you're yeah. going to get found out it, it's a, it, sadly yeah. it's a, it's a quite a selfish world isn't it it's yeah and, and for sports it it's incredibly selfish but it's quite short lived and the hard bit is the fact that you're 27, you've hopefully got another six, seven years of professional rugby mm. in you. Um, but it, it's a short-lived selfishness, whereas in other aspects of life, sometimes getting to that high performance can be very selfish. You've got to sacrifice things. Definitely. People around you have to sacrifice or understand your sacrifices to get mm. it. It's, it's not all kind of sitting there having flat whites. You know, <laughs> and is it? It's, it's hard work. Yeah, 100%. Well, Harry, thank you for giving out your time. Um, I wish you all the best, but you're already doing pretty well, my man. So just keep doing it. Thanks, enjoy. mate. I appreciate it. I really enjoyed that. It's really uh, good to do a bit of reflection like that. It's really, really cool.